Chapter 23 Why Not Live Well? March 5 was a murky sort of day outside, with a fine cold drizzle, but in the ward, it was a day of surprises and events. The evening before, Dayomka had signed his agreement to the operation, so he was moving down to the surgical ward. That day they also moved in two new patients. The first took Dayomka's bed, the one in the corner by the door. He was a tall man, but he had a terrible stoop, a crooked spine, and a worn face like a very old man's. His eyes were so swollen, his lower eyelids so pulled down, that instead of the horizontal oval everyone has in their eyes, he had something more like a circle. And in each circle, the white had an unhealthy reddish tinge. They were bright, brownish, iridescent rings, larger looking than usual because of the distended lower eyelids. With these great round eyes, the old man seemed to be examining everyone with an unpleasant, attentive gaze. During the past week, Dayomka had not been himself. He had had unceasing aches and shooting pains in his leg, so that he could no longer sleep or take part in anything. It was a real effort holding himself together so as not to cry out and disturb his neighbors. All this had worn him out to the point where he no longer thought of his leg as precious, but as a cursed burden he ought to get rid of as quickly and as easily as possible. A month ago, the operation had seemed like the end of life, but now it seemed like salvation. Thus do our standards change. Dayomka had taken the advice of every single man in the ward before signing his agreement. Still, even today, as he was tying up his bundle of belongings and saying his goodbyes, turned the conversation to make people calm him down and reassure him. So Vadim had to repeat what he had already said, that Dayomka was lucky to get off so easily. That he, Vadim, would have taken his place with pleasure. Dayomka still managed to find objections. But the bone, they saw it through with a saw. They just saw it through like a log. They say you can feel it under any anesthetic. But Vadim was unable to console anyone for long, nor did he wish to. Come on now, he said. You're not the first one it's happened to. Others have to put up with it. You'll put up with it too. In this case, as in every other, he was being just as impartial. He had asked for no consolation himself, and if offered it, he would not have accepted it. There was something spineless, religious even, about every attempt to console. Vadim was just as proud, collected, and courteous as he had been during his first days in the hospital. The only difference was that his swarthy mountaineer's skin had started to turn yellow. Occasionally, too, his lips would tremble with pain, his forehead twitch with impatience and bewilderment. So long as he had just been saying he was doomed to die in eight months, but had still gone riding and flying to Moscow and meeting Sheregordotsev. He had been convinced at the bottom of his heart that he would escape the trap. But now, here he was. He had been here a month, one month out of the eight he had left, and maybe not the first, but the third or the fourth out of the eight. And every day, walking became more painful. Already he found it difficult even to imagine mounting a horse and riding out into the field. Already the pain had spread to his groin. He had by now read three of the books he had brought with him, but he was losing his conviction that the discovery of ores by radioactive water was the only essential thing in his life. Therefore, he was reading less intently than before, making fewer question and exclamation marks. Vadim had always reckoned his life 
was at its best when he was so busy that there were not enough hours in the day. But now, somehow, he found the days quite long enough, too long even. Only there was not enough life. His tightly strung capacity for work had begun to sag. Seldom now did he wake early and read his books in the quiet of the morning. Sometimes he would just lie there, the blankets pulled over his head, and the idea would seep into his mind that perhaps to give in and end it all would be easier than to struggle. He began to feel the terrifying absurdity of these paltry surroundings and idiotic conversations, and the urge to rip apart his polished self-control and howl as a wild animal howls at its snare. All right, stop playing the fool. Let go of my leg. Vadim's mother had been to see four highly placed officials, but had still not managed to get any colloidal gold. She had brought some chaga from Russia and arranged for the nurse to bring him jugs of infusion every other day. There's an asterisk next to chaga. Uh, apparently that is a birch tree fungus believed by many to be a cure for cancer. Then she went back to Moscow for more interviews to try to get some gold. She could not come to terms with the possibility that radioactive gold might exist somewhere, and yet her son's secondaries were still penetrating his groin. Dayomka went up to Kostoglatov to say or to hear some word of farewell. Kostoglatov was lying diagonally across his bed, his feet up on the rail and his head hanging over the mattress into the aisle. They saw each other upside down. Oleg held out his hand and said quietly, in parting, he now found it hard to speak loudly. He could feel something reverberating under his lungs. Don't lose your nerve, Dayomka. Lev Leonorovich is here. I saw him. He'll have it chopped off in no time. Is he? Dayomka's face lit up. Did you see him yourself? That's right. Well, that's something. What a good thing I held out. Indeed, it was enough for his lanky surgeon with his overlong drooping arms to appear in the clinic corridors, and immediately the patients began to take heart, as though realizing that this long-legged fellow was just the man they had been missing all month. If they had paraded all the surgeons in front of the patients and let the patients take their pick, there is little doubt that each would have signed on for Lev Leonovich. He always looked so bored, the way he walked about the clinic, but this expression they interpreted as a sign that it was not the day for operations. Although Yevgenia Ustanova was quite good enough for Dionka, although little, fragile Yevgenia Ustanova was a splendid surgeon, still, it was an entirely different feeling lying beneath the hairy, ape-like hands of Lev Leonovich. Because, however it turned out, whether he saved you or not, it wouldn't be because he'd make a mistake. Of this, Dayomka was somehow quite convinced. The intimacy between patient and surgeon is short-lived, but closer than between a son and his own father. He's a good surgeon, is he? came a muffled question from the new boy, with the swollen eyes in the bed that had once been Dionka's. He looked absent-minded, and as if someone had taken him by surprise. He was shivering. Even inside the ward, he wore a fustian dressing gown over his pajamas, unfastened and unbelted. The old man stared at him as if, alone in a house, he had been awakened by a knock at the door in the middle of the night. He had got out of bed and couldn't make out what was threatening him. Uh-huh, Dayomka grunted. His face was brightening all the time. He looked as if his operation was already half over. He's a champ, that boy. Are you for an operation, too? What have you got? Yes, I am for one, too, was all the new boy replied. It was as if he had not heard the whole of Dayomka's question. His face in no way mirrored Dayomka's relief. There was no change in his great round fixed eyes, 
Either they gazed much too intently, or else they were completely unseen. Dionka went away. They made up the bed for the new boy, who sat down on it and leaned against the wall. Once more, his enlarged eyes gazed in silence. He did not move them about, but would focus them on some man in the ward and gaze at him for ages. Then he would turn his head and gaze at someone else, or else perhaps look straight past him. He did not move or react to the sounds and stir in the ward. He did not speak, did not ask or answer questions. An hour went by, and all they could get out of him was that he came from Fergana. Then one of the nurses called him, revealing that his name was Shulubin. He was an eagle owl. That's what he was. Rasanov at once recognized those fixed, round, completely immobile eyes. The ward was not a particularly merry place, as it was, so the last thing they needed was this eagle owl. Gloomily, Shulubin fixed his gaze on Rasanov and stared at him for so long that it became quite unpleasant. He gazed at everyone like this, as though each man in the ward had done him a bad turn. Life in the ward could no longer continue in its normal, unconstrained way. The day before, Pavel Nikolaevich had had his twelfth injection. He was now used to these injections and could take them without going into delirium. But he kept getting headaches and felt generally weaker. The main thing that had emerged was there was no danger of his dying. Of course, the whole thing had been no more than a family panic. Half his tumor had already disappeared, while the part that remained straddling his neck had softened so that although it still got in his way, it was not as bad as before. His head had recovered its freedom of movement. The only thing left was the weakness, and one can put up with the weakness. There's even something agreeable about it. Just lying there and reading, reading Ogonoyak and Crocodile, Asterisk next to these two names. Ogonyok is a Soviet illustrated weekly magazine. Crocodile is the leading Soviet satirical and cartoon journal. Which is kind of funny because Crocodile in the United States is probably the worst drug you can, you can take. Um, tangent a little bit, but here we go back to the story. Taking tonics and choosing some tasty thing he felt like eating. If only he could talk to some agreeable people and listen to the radio, but he'd have that when he went home. The weakness would have been the only thing if it hadn't been for Donsova's painful probing into his armpits, the hard pressure of her fingers poking as though with a stick. She was looking for something, and having been there a month, he could guess what it was another tumor. She would also call him down to her surgery, lay him out on the couch and probe his groin, again pressing him painfully and sharply. Might it really start up somewhere else? Pavel Nikolaevich would ask her in alarm, his joy over the collapse of his tumor quite dimmed. That's why we are treating you to stop that happening, Don Sova would shake her head. But we'll have to give you a lot more injections. How many? Rasonov would ask in terror. We'll see. Doctors never tell you anything straight out. He was so weak from the twelve he had had already. They were shaking their heads over his blood count. Might he really have to endure the same number again? By hook or by crook, the disease was overpowering him. The tumor had abated. But this was no real cause for joy. Pavel Nikolaevich passed his days listlessly, mostly lying down. Incidentally, even Boneshoer had become quite tame. He had stopped roaring and snarling, and it was obvious now he wasn't pretending. The disease had laid him low, too. More and more often, he would let his head hang, dangling over the end of the bed, and lie there like that for hours, screwing up his eyes. Pavel Nikolaevich would be taking powders for his headaches, slapping a wet rag over his forehead and covering up his eyes against the light. And so they would lie side by side for hours on end, quite peaceably, without 
joining battle. They had hung a banner across the wide staircase landing. A little fellow who had spent his time sucking oxygen balloons had been taken away from there to the morgue. The message was written in the usual way in white letters on a long piece of red calico. Patience. Do not discuss each other's illnesses. Of course, with such a grand piece of calico hanging in such a prominent spot, some slogan to celebrate the October Revolution, or 1st of May anniversaries, would have been more suitable. But this was an important appeal for the people who lived here. Pavel Nikolaevich had mentioned the matter several times, to stop patients upsetting himself and each other. Generally speaking, it would have been more statesmanlike, more correct, not to keep the tumor patients all in one place, but to spread them out amongst ordinary people, among ordinary hospitals. They wouldn't frighten one another, and then one would be able to hide the truth from them, which would be much more humane. The people in the ward came and went, but no one ever seemed to be happy. They were always so dejected and withered. Only Amajan, who had already abandoned his crutch and was soon to be discharged, showed his white teeth in a grin. But this did not cheer anyone else except himself. Probably the only effect it had was to make people jealous. Then suddenly, a couple of hours after the gloomy new boy's arrival, on this gray, depressing day when everyone was lying on their beds, when the window panes washed by the rain let in so little light that one felt like turning on the electric lights even before the midday meal and longed for the evening to come more quickly, suddenly a shortish, energetic-looking man walked briskly and healthily into the ward, straight past the nurse who was showing him in. He didn't really enter the ward. He burst into it hurriedly, as if there was a guard of honor drawn up in ranks to greet him. Men who had been waiting for him and getting tired. When he saw how listlessly everyone was lying on their beds, he stopped dead. He even whistled. Then, in a voice of energetic reproach, he announced proudly, Hey, boys, you're a lot of dopes, aren't you? Have your feet shriveled up or something? Even though the men were not exactly a welcoming guard of honor, he greeted them with a semi-military gesture, like a salute. Charlie Maxim Petrovich, it's a pleasure. Stand at ease. There was nothing of the exhaustion of cancer on his face. His smile twinkled with confidence and joie de vivre. Joie de vivre. Vivre. I don't know this word. It seems French. Twinkled with confidence and joie de vivre. And some of the men smiled back at him. Pavel Nikolaevich was one of these. A month with all these nincompoops, and now it looks as if we have got a man at last. Well then, he did not ask anyone, but his quick eyes spotted his bed and he strode boldly across to it. It was the bed next to Pavel Nikolaevich, one that had been Mursalimov's. The new man went in on the side he shared with Pavel Nikolaevich. He sat down on the bed, bounced it up and down, and it creaked. Sixty percent worn out, he quipped. The senior doctor's no rat catcher, you can see that. He started to unload his belongings, but it turned out there was nothing to unload. He carried nothing in his hands. He had a razor in one pocket and a pack in another pocket. Not a cigarette pack, but a pack of playing cards. Almost new ones. He took out the pack, flipped through it with his fingers, and turned his clever-looking eyes toward Pavel Nikolaevich. Do you indulge? he asked him. Yes, sometimes, Pavel Nikolaevich admitted amiably. Do you play preference? Preference, according to the asterisk, is a form of contract bridge. Do you play preference? Not really. I like casino best. That's not a game, said Charlie sternly. I really need to figure out how to pronounce that. The word is C-H-A-L-Y. It sounds like I'm doing some kind of weird accent, like a New York accent of Charlie, but that's, that's not what it looks like, so... 
But yes, I'm just going to call this guy... I guess it's Charlie. Could be Kaylee. C-H-A-L-Y. Can anyone do a quick Google and see how you pronounce that name? Just out of curiosity to myself. Because uh, I really don't feel like saying it wrong for the next 25 pages and then... It's like, how do you pronounce C-H-A-L-Y? In a Russian book. It's okay if nobody wants to do that. I'll just, uh, I'll call him Charlie, because that's what it seems like. All right, back to the book. That's not a game, said Charlie sternly. What about Hoist, or 21, or Poker? Well, not really, Rusanov waved one arm in embarrassment. There was no place to learn. We'll teach you here, or else. Charlie said enthusiastically. It's like they say, if you can't, we'll teach you. If you won't, we'll make you. He was laughing. His nose was too big for his face. It was a great, soft, reddened nose. But it was this that gave his face its simple-hearted, attractive, and open quality. Poker's the best game in the world, he declared authoritatively. You bet blind in poker. He had already counted Pavel Nikolaevich in and was looking around for more players. But there was no one nearby to inspire him with hope. Me, I'll learn, Amajan shouted from behind him. Fine, said Charlie encouragingly. Fine. Try and find something we can put between the beds for a table. He looked around the ward once more, saw the frozen gaze of Shlubin, then spotted a Uzbek in a pink turban with a drooping mustache, as fine as though made of silver thread. It was then that Nelia came in with a bucket and cloth. She had been told to give the floors an extra wash. Aha, said Charlie, appreciatively, straight away. What a girl we've run across here. Hey, where were you before? We'd have had a ride on the swing together, wouldn't we? Nalia stuck out her thick lips, which was her way of smiling. Well, it's not too late, is it? She said. Only you're sick, aren't you? What use are you to a girl? A woman a day keeps the doctor away, Charlie retorted. Why, are you afraid of me? Why should I be afraid of you? You're not much of a man, said Nelia, getting him in her sights. I'm man enough to get through you. Don't you worry, Charlie exclaimed. Come on, hurry up then, get down and wash the floor. We want to inspect the facade. Look, as much as you like. We don't charge for that, said Nelia. She was enjoying herself. She slapped the wet cloth under the first bed, bent down and started washing. Maybe the man wasn't ill at all. There was no visible sores on him, and judging by his face, there was no internal pain either. Or was he controlling himself with a great effort of will, showing an example unprecedented in the ward, but one which a Soviet man really ought to set? Pavel Nikolaevich looked at Charlie enviously. But what's wrong with you? He asked Charlie quietly, so that only he could hear. Me? Charlie shook himself. I've got polyps. None of the patients knew exactly what polyps were, even though they came across them quite often in one another. Does it hurt? Well, as soon as it started to hurt, I came along here. You want to cut it out? All right, go ahead. Why stall? Where is it, then? Rusanov asked him with increasing respect. In my stomach, I think, Charlie remarked casually. He even smiled. I reckon they'll cut out my beautiful old stomach. They'll hack away three quarters of it. With the edge of his hand, he sawed away at his stomach and squinted. What will you do then? Asked Rasonov in amazement. Not a thing. I'll just have to get used to it. As long as it still soaks up the vodka. But you have such wonderful self-control. Listen to me, neighbor. Charlie nodded his head up and down. His face, with its big reddish nose, was kindness itself, simplicity shone in his eyes, 
If you don't want to croak, you shouldn't get yourself upset. Less talk, less pain. That's my advice to you. At the moment, Amajan appeared with a board made of plywood. They set it up between Rasanov and Charlie's bed. It was quite firm. That's more civilized, said Amajan happily. Turn on the light, Charlie ordered. He turned on a light. The room brightened up. Well, what about a fourth? There was no fourth to be found. Never mind, explain it to us, said Rasanov. He was becoming quite cheerful. There he sat, legs on the floor, just like a healthy man. When he turned his head, the pain in his neck was much less than before. Maybe it was only a piece of a board, but he imagined himself sitting at a nice little card table with a cheerful bright lamp shining from the ceiling. The signs of the gaily inscribed red and black... All right, I'm going to stop here because we're about halfway through and the Carter Banks hour is technically five minutes from being over. We still have like 10, 12 pages of this and I read really slow. Seems like a good place to set the scene for the next chapter, which I'll read tomorrow at 9 p.m. Central Standard Time. Anyway, thanks everyone for tuning in. Stay safe. And don't die.